Hi, everyone. I'm Elliot Higgins. I am the founder of Bellingcat. Um, Bellingcat was an organization I founded in 2014. Um, back then, it was just really myself and a website and not much <laughs> else. But it came out of my interest in something that's known as open source investigation. And open source investigation is using publicly available material to investigate a range of different topics. Now, it's something that's been done for many years in World War II British intelligence would use German newspapers to try and figure out how many losses the Germans had in the war. But about 15 years ago, things changed dramatically because we had the rise of the smartphone. Everyone started getting these devices in their pockets where they could capture information, photographs, videos, little snippets of text, and share them through social media apps. In parallel to that, you also had the rise of platforms like Google Earth, you Google Street View, and other sites that provided reference material. And these two de separate developments allowed us to start investigating things in a way that was not really ever possible before. But this entire field of open source investigation didn't come from uh, people with professional backgrounds. It came from people like me, keen amateurs, who were following things like the conflict in Libya during the Arab Spring and getting a bit too obsessed about what was being shared online and arguing with people on the internet. Um, and I really started off doing this because I was just wanted to know what was happening. I was just interested in the topic, and I could see a huge amount of video footage and other information being shared online that was just being ignored by the mainstream media, NGOs, think tanks, and other organizations because they didn't really know how to fact-check this stuff. So after two years of uh, blogging, I started a website called Bellingcat. I launched it on July 14th, 2014. And that was a few days before Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 was shot down over eastern Ukraine, something that became really Bellingcat's first major investigation and also acted as a huge catalyst for a community of online investigators that really was enabled by uh, Twitter, which um, is still really a place where people come together and look at events from across the world. And from there, I developed a team of volunteers, and that team of volunteers investigated first MH17 and a broader range of topics around Ukraine in 2014. And that really developed the entire field of open source investigation. But one thing I wanted to make sure is that what we were doing was not something that was a kind of a magic trick. It, when I used to go to journalism conferences in 2013, present my work, and the journalists would it, would... it was like I was putting rabbits out of the hat. And it wasn't like that at all. It was just a very simple process in many cases. So the point of Bellingcat was not just to report on things, but show other people how to do this themselves. And really now in 2022 with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia we're seeing open source investigation really coming of age because over the past eight years we've trained, se trained several thousand journalists and investigators and we're really seeing the impact of that and I'm going to take you through now how this reporting has changed with the conflict in Ukraine and even before the invasion there's information that was becoming available and part of that information were videos like this being shared by ordinary Russians, TikTok videos showing Russian troop movements around the border with Ukraine. Literally hundreds and hundreds of these videos were being produced just because these people on the ground saw something cool and wanted to share it on TikTok. So we can really thank the Chinese for the availability of this information. <laughs> And because of our experience and the experience of our community with conflict, I myself worked for years on the conflict in Syria, we knew what kind of information needed to be preserved and mapped very early on. So one of the first things that was does, done was this mapping operation. This is done by an organization we partnered with called the Center for Information Resilience. And here what you see, each of these points is a video from before the invasion that had been precisely located and links to a social media post with the videos in it. And what this shows is in the, prior to the invasion, we could see this buildup happening. We weren't just relying on media reports or what governments were telling us or the intelligence services. We could see what was happening as ordinary individuals and share this information publicly. And this really, when there was a lot of debate about what was gonna happen, we could see multiple rocket launchers, brigades, military units moving closer and closer to the border in the days before the invasion. And this is very valuable information. This is the kind of information that really 10 years ago wasn't readily available. But now, 
with this kind of collective collaborative effort is you know discoverable and can be investigated but there's other kinds of videos being shared and i'm going to show you now a video that was shared by the russian separatist republic the donetsk people's republic um, a few days prior to the invasion and this is a video that they claimed showed saboteurs attacking a chlorine tank in a treatment facility. And you really can't see too much here, as you can tell. There's some grass, some light, an explosion. And it was shared on Telegram, a social media site, with all this information about what was happening. And here they were claiming that subators were going to blow up a container with chlorine. And this fed into a... Um, branch of Russian propaganda, we can say, that there was going to be a fake chemical incident that would be blamed on Russia. And it was kind of this propaganda war that was going back and forth, really trying to preempt the invasion. But the people who share this, the Donetsk People's Republic, they share this on February 18th, saying this had happened overnight. They'd captured someone taking the footage from his body camera, and they shared it on Telegram. But Telegram, unlike other social media sites, uh, preserves all the metadata of those videos. So this is just a few pages of the metadata that was attached to that video. And it is the blueprint to a forgery. And what happened is this online community through Twitter came together, people from a whole range of different backgrounds, and started digging through this direct data and trying to figure out what it all meant. One of the first things that really stood out was the creation date was 10 days before the event took place. Um, so that made us immediately suspicious. We then started digging through things like um, the, the, this particular field tells you the project path, which again was created 10 days before this attack occurred. You had also this, uh, this um, software agent, which showed it was actually edited in Premiere Pro. And most importantly was this ingredients path file. This is one of the other videos that made up this final video. And this file name... A lot of people instantly recognize this format because this is what you get when you download videos from YouTube. So someone copied and pasted that title and pasted it into YouTube and found this video with exactly the same title that was actually a Finnish um, arms uh, range firing rockets. And an audio engineer compared the waveforms of each explosion in this video to the explosions in the fake video and could actually find the exact explosion they had copied and pasted. In fact, they were able to show that the explosion in the fake video cut off just as the soldiers in this video started cheering after the rocket had been fired. And this was done in a matter of hours. And this is important because in the past, disinformation often takes days, weeks, or even months to debunk. But because you've now got this kind of critical mass of people engaged with the topic, they can take it apart very quickly and really stop disinformation entering those information ecosystems that propagate this disinformation. It's almost pre-bunking this kind of stuff. So we had this online community that came together. They were debunking disinformation, but they were also doing something called geolocation. So geolocation is looking at video footage, photographs, and using visual clues, comparing it to things like satellite mapping imagery to find exactly where stuff was filmed. And this is something we do a lot at Balinca. It's really a core... Uh, kind of principle of verification. You need to know where something was filmed or photographed to be able to prove it's real. And this was starting to happen with these communities. It was disorganized, but people just wanted to try and help out in some way. So we saw all these efforts, and we wanted to turn this into useful data. So we created a project very, very rapidly called the Global Authentication Project, where we trained dozens of volunteers to verify geolocation. And we created this platform that allows a kind of feed, constant feed of videos that need verification. And that then feeds into a much larger data set. This is a public platform at ukraine.balincat.com that shows all of these verified incidents of civilian harms. They're sorted by categories. Um, we, you can download the data yourself and do what you wish with it. That we are actually providing these data sets to a whole range of actors, NGOs, um, justice and accountability organizations, so they rapidly have useful information coming from the ground that's verified, that's geolocated, so they can use that in their own work. And that can ha help, for example, guide demining efforts. We categorize videos that show cluster munitions, so they know where these things are being used. And this is really a response to what we learned through the conflict in Syria, because what happened with Syria is you had literally millions of videos being shared online, 
and no one was really tracking them, no one was ver verifying them, no one was preserving them, and lots of these videos have been lost over time. So from day one, we found it very important to preserve this evidence and make sure it was searchable. But as the conflict progressed, we saw more and more incidents of civilian harm, of infrastructure being targeted, like hospitals. And there was a, early on an incident in Mariupol that really showed how disinformation uh, is spread by the Russian Federation. And this is an ongoing thing. I mean, over my years of work, I've dealt with a massive amount of disinformation from Russia. But this is one example where this woman was photographed leaving the building after it was bombed. It was a maternity hospital. And this second woman was shown being carried out of the building. And this woman, sadly, she died soon after this photograph was taken. But very quickly, you had these people online, just kind of random Twitter users, making claims that these two different women were actually the same women, and she was posing for these photographs, and it was all part of disinformation and propaganda. Now, these are just kind of random Twitter users with like 100 followers. So you could say, well, that who, who cares? The problem is the Russian embassy of the UK started spreading these same claims. And this became really, this is a pattern we see all the time. People think of Russia as kind of creating this disinformation and spreading it, but often they're just stealing ideas off the internet and then repeating it. And this is kind of most, I think, clearly demonstrated in this interview I'm about to show you. Uh, it's on, from Dutch television. It shows the Russian ambassador to the Netherlands talking about this incident and displaying the evidence he has that this woman is not who she claims she is. So he's citing Instagram comments from people, just like for Fighting Joe 557 and Katia 0777. That's the evidence that he's presenting to support his claims. Um, but something has changed quite significantly with the conflict in Ukraine. We found years ago is really Balinkat versus Russia in many circumstances because there weren't many fact-checking organizations. But we have put a huge amount of effort into training the media to do exactly the kind of investigations that we do. We don't really see this in terms of competition. We see it in terms of making a kind of better information environment, making people well-informed. So by the time he was on TV making these ridiculous claims, we had the likes of CNN, who had already done a very in-depth analysis of the attack, found out who these people were, really debunked all these lies days before they were saying them. And this is partly because, we, you know, through the training, but also the, the availability of the information we have. One thing we've got now is a lot of satellite imagery. And this is um, some footage from Crimea when there was an attack on a Russian airbase. It was very surprising because this was deep in Russian-held territory. And... There was no information coming from this. We had these videos filmed on the beaches, but nothing inside the base, because obviously Russians aren't going to film around you know, their own air bases and show us what's happened. But what we do have now is the accessibility of satellite information that is very, very up to date. So this is an image from before the, the day before the attack. And within 24 hours, using the service Planet, which we're subscribed to, we had an image of the aftermath of the attack. So we knew what had happened on the ground, even though there was no actual information coming directly from the air base. The accessibility of high-resolution satellite imagery has really changed our way that we can see conflict. In another example where satellite imagery was useful was the um, uh, Bucha, when Ukrainian forces entered the town, they found bodies on the street, really horrific scenes. And again, these you know, random social media accounts making claims. One of the popular claim was that one of the soldiers on the ground, one of the corpses, was actually moving. You could see his hand move. And again, this was repeated by a Russian embassy. It was promoted and shared widely on social media. But you can actually just watch the footage, and you'll see this now. A water droplet just moves across the body, and that's the hand they're claiming is moving. So these are all things that are very easily debunked. They also were claiming that these, these bodies had been placed there to smear the Russian military. But the New York Times, uh, their team run by Malachi Brown, who's really with me and a handful of other people, were one of the first people 10 years ago to really start doing this stuff, used satellite imagery to show that all these bodies had been there for weeks. And they furthered their investigation uh, in a, something they've released recently that 
draws on drone imagery from uh, Ukrainian forces. It has CCTV footage from the street where this happened, video filmed by people on the ground, where they use these visual investigation methodologies that we've used at Balinkat to investigate what happened on the ground. And they've been able to establish the units involved in war crimes, in taking people away and killing them. Um, but all of this is quite grim. But and we found with Syria that of people don't want to engage with that. And what's actually happened, also rather unusually with Ukraine, is you've had another community emerge that um, is kind of more kind of light-hearted. Because when you're dealing with ridiculous people, Russian officials saying ridiculous things all the time, it can be quite irritating. And one reaction is to get really angry. The other one is to mock them relentlessly. And this community formed online called the North Atlantic Fellow Organization. It was a kind of ad hoc community that came together. They, it kind of really drew from kind of early 2000s forum culture with memes and just being annoying. Um, but what happened is that actually drew this community together. So even the people who are quite serious analysts got into doing this. A website called St. Javelin, which is a clothing store that sells kind of basically meme-based clothing, started producing the, the, this merchandise. They've now raised over a million dollars for charitable organizations in Ukraine. Um, you've also got like the Defense um, Ministry of Ukraine actually kind of really leaning into this. And it's it helped really build a community around this that continues to keep people engaged. Now, with Bellingcat, what we're trying to do is take open source investigation even further because we really see the value of this as evidence for justice and accountability. So we've been working over the past few years on something we call the Yemen Project, which is developing investigation methods that could be applied in court based off legal methodologies. We've worked with lawyers from the Global Legal Action Network and this developed a methodology that we're now applying to investigations in Ukraine. And these investigations are purely based off open source. And they're being provided to a range of uh, international bodies for accountability purposes. We've also developed reports with them that will be used by other accountability actors to base their own work on. I never intended to do this. I always thought that Human Rights Watch or Amnesty would figure this stuff out. But they never did. So we just came down to doing it ourselves. So. We've done a lot of work on developing these ideas of how do we use this evidence in court. And one project we're doing at the moment goes back to this idea of collecting all this video evidence. Now, with Syria, there were lots of organizations who did this. And you ended up with lots of archives of material that were just all over the place and not really discoverable. So what we've, we are doing at the moment is developing a platform that allows multiple archives to be searched from one index online to make this information rather than it being a case of dozens of emails and letters and phone calls to get a video from someone. You just go to a platform, select an area, and you get all the available information from that individual area. Because I believe this is the best way to make sure that accountability does happen for the things that are documented in these videos. Um, and that's uh, Bellingham. So thank you. Thank you so much, Elliot. And you actually started this organization that we're seeing now, seeing the results of what you're doing. You started on your own. And with the mission of not having an agenda. But when you're seeing how people are manipulating evidence, and we're seeing these shocking things on the screen here, are you feeling that you're becoming more of an activist at times? There is a line, I mean, we have this internal debate at Bellingcat all the time, what kinds of organization are we? Because inevitably, if you're fact-checking information coming from conflict zones or in the media or anywhere, you're going to be in opposition to someone. And certainly the reaction of the Russian Federation to our work has been very oppositional, it's fair to say. Um, so it does put us in a position where beyond just the work of investigating, in a sense we have to not only defend our own work, but the entire field of open source investigation. Mm. And we find ourselves at really the forefront of this all the time. We didn't come from kind of traditional backgrounds, so we aren't 
a media organization or an NGO or an activist organization. But in a way, the kind of work we do touches on all of those areas. So often what we look at when we're doing our projects is we try and identify potential partners who say, are, you know, like Spiegel in Germany, for example, we've partnered with a lot, a smaller NGO like Lighthouse Reports in the Netherlands. And we combine all our efforts. And because open source evidence is something that can be shared, we aren't asking people to give us their secret sources, which saying, this is something on the internet. It means collaboration is something that becomes really key to what we're doing. And it means that we can, in a sense, attack the issues from multiple directions at once. We can have the more traditional investigation. We can have a more kind of an advocacy type group being involved as well. And it means that there's more impact from these investigations. And if we get into the details here and into the, the work, really, I've read your book uh, about Bellingcat, and, and you're saying for a year and a half, you watched every single video coming out from Syria, for example. That this is the kind of thorough work that you're actually doing. And uh, how do you know that the material you are getting in is solid enough? Well, that's the second part. After you watch it, you've got to actually make sure it's shown what it claims to. Yeah. Um, so I would go for a process every day where you, you would have basically every armed group, every media center, every kind of activist would have a YouTube channel. And you could follow those YouTube channels. And I would just have an endless list of videos coming from Syria. They'd generally be something from like 30 to two minutes long, very short. And I'd scan through them quickly. And th some were the same kind of things like aircraft flying through the air. And you know you didn't, couldn't really do much with that. But then you would find stuff that was new or unique. And the question was then, can you verify what's in these videos? Now, I don't speak Arabic, so I didn't know what anyone was saying, but I could see the visual stuff. So I focused on arms identification, and over a, a period of time, I taught myself how to identify every single weapon that was appearing. And that began with things like just kind of normal dumb bombs and cluster munitions and sentry munitions. This is some, not something you knew when you started the work. Yeah, fortunately, there's lots of kind of real weapons nerds on the internet who obsess <laughs> about this stuff, and I just drew off their n knowledge. Like, they would go to arms museums and take lots of high-resolution photographs so I could say, OK, that bolt belongs to that particular weapon. And um, that then moved into things like chemical weapons attacks, where because I was only the, the only person really obsessing over this particular aspect of the conflict, mm -hmm. I could say that the weapons used in, for example, the August 21st, 2013 sarin attacks had appeared elsewhere in the conflict. Mm -hmm. And no one else had really w was aware of that, because these were videos that had maybe had two or 300 views on YouTube. I and I was really the only person who had systematically watched all of them. Mm. And in this work, how do you finance the organization? How do you finance what you're doing? So we um, try and have a diverse range of funders. Um, and that makes up about 60% of our income. So they, those are various family foundations and things like that. We get about 30% of our income from workshops that we run. Um, and then the remaining amount comes from various small donations, crowdfunding, and things like that. We've also just started a production company, and we're making documentaries based off our work now. So the hope is they'll turn a profit, and then we'll be fed back into our research. So there is a role also for investors here. Yeah, ab absolutely. We've been um, <laughs> we've um, got three projects on the go already. One is based off the we've done a lot of work into Russian assassinations, and we're bringing that all together into one documentary project. That's the one that's further ahead, but we're doing one on MH17, kind of with the trial com being complete in uh, The Hague. We really want to do a series that just brings together everything that happened over the last 10 years with MH17. Um, plus, we're doing one on Syria that focuses on a um, massacre that was reported in The Guardian late last year. And it's quite unique because a, um, a researcher was sent these videos, and she works on genocide research, mm. and um, she started basically catfishing the uh, people in the video who were committing the war crimes. She made a fake persona, started befriend befriending them online, and then spent four years basically getting to know a couple of hundred Syrian intelligence officers mm -hmm. and just understanding how they think, how they operate. And she kind of became their, they, almost for them, confessional. They didn't realize that she was a researcher. They thought she was just this pretty girl they were talking to, but they were talking about a lot of things that we are now kind of looking at in this documentary. And this work obviously is not very safe. It, it could have 
quite a lot of risks attached to it. How do you protect the people? Well, it, it, it used to be a bit easier when it was just Russia kind of lying about us and putting out disinformation because we could kind of counter that. And that was really from 2015 to 2018. I was targeted in cyber campaigns as well, people trying to hack my emails, but it didn't really work. Mm -hmm. um, but then in 2018, with the Scripple poisoning investigation, we really got their attention mm -hmm. because we went from being amateurs to then being kind of them claiming we were working for the intelligence services. Mm -hmm. um, I currently have like uh, the terrorism, counter terrorism police in the UK who are in contact with me. Christo Grozev, who does a lot of our Russia research, he was recently put on the wanted list in Russia for unspecified reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's resulted in him having police protection uh, in his home of Austria. He's Bulgarian as well. Um, so in Bulgaria, they've told him not to come to the country because they don't think they could offer him protection. So we have to be um, careful. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and there are questions coming in as we speak from the audience also, uh, Elliot. And, and one is uh, wondering about how you uh, address or prevent infiltrators into your pool of volunteers. So part of it is that um, the infant, using open sources and examining it means it's quite transparent that if you say geolocate a video and you're wrong, it's quite obvious because once something's geolocated, you're basically playing spot the difference between a video and satellite imagery. Mm. And if someone is consistently wrong about that kind of thing, then you can just kind of dismiss what they're saying. And this is why in our process as well, um, we have basically three kind of layers of geolocation. We have the initial claim that might come from social media or someone sends us. We then have our internal uh, volunteer community that verifies it again. And then we have one of our staff members also verify that geolocation. So by the time it's entered into our data set, we've had you know, at least three attempts to look at each one. If it's something that's kind of more in-depth research, we have very strict editorial policies. Um, we try and triangulate data as much as possible. Um, so it's really about just having robust kind of fact-checking and internal verification policies, and that'll pick up anyone who's doing a bad job, be it through just a lack of skill or you know something more malicious. Mm. And one person in our audience asks, do you ever fear for your life? I wouldn't say fear for my life. I'm cautious about my life, I would say, more than anything. Um, it, it's... It's just kind of a fact of my life now, and I, although there is the risk involved, I'm, you know, I think the work we do is very important. I'm pleased to be able to do it. Mm. Um, it also means that we can help people in countries where there are far more direct risk. You know, the work we've done on Syria, for example, the work we've done on Yemen. If those people in those countries who were sharing that information got involved with the research that we were doing, and they were doing it in their own country, they would be jailed or worse. So. In a way, it allows you this kind of international kind of network that can support people in places where they are at risk um, from relative safety. If you get a new video, what is it you definitely would need to be able to geolocate it? Well, I mean, we've done geolocations on very kind of scant material. I, the most impressive one I saw, um, one of our staff did, was a, it was a photograph taken inside a bare concrete room. And they managed to find out where it was taken because they figured out that it was a um, garage and they searched for photographs of garages in and around the location it was likely taken in until they managed to find one that was at the right angle where you could see a smudge on the back wall on this outside photograph that could be geolocated yeah. that matched the one from inside the building. So, I mean, anything's possible. I mean, one... one uh, investigation I did in um, Syria was looking at the bombing of this hosp hospital and they had lots of CCTV footage of this building and videos filmed after bombings and this place was bombed more than a dozen times and had various levels of damage and I basically took all these separate videos and pieced them together like a 3D jigsaw puzzle and then we actually mapped, the, we basically recreated the entire building as a 3D model with our colleagues at Forensic Architecture and mapped all the images inside and there was one video where they walk outside from the building and it just shows one corridor on the outside but that was geolocatable but then you could link it to every single video in that building so we could confirm exactly where this stuff was taken so it's that kind of yeah mm. puzzling it out really and you're telling in the book about how uh, you saw this gap in information and also with traditional intelligence agencies sort of not paying attention to everything that was out there 
Are they doing it now? It's really with Ukraine, it's just been a, a huge change to what it was like before. There's so many organizations, um, you know, from every field really, who now see if you're not using open source investigation, then you aren't really doing a proper job. We've really seen that, you know, through the media, especially in the US now, more and more visual investigation teams, as they like to call them, being set up at various um, places. The New York Times was really the first that did that. We've seen CNN do that. The Washington Post have just set, set up a new team. Um, and many of them are teams that we've been training over the years and individuals that we've taught the skills to. And we have to touch on one of the films, one of the films that you are producing with um, the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader, and uh, where you actually managed to get on tape the confession of his would-be killer. And we see Alexei Navalny interviewing for 49 minutes his would-be killer and getting everything. How was that possible? How could you identify that team? Well, this is thanks to the fact that Russia is just so corrupt at every level that everything's for sale. So <laughs> traditional open source is using publicly available information. Yeah. The thing is in Russia, you have basically there's loads of people who share data from their work online. And it can be things like people's phone records, government databases, and it's so easily accessible. It's like for a, like $10, you can get someone's phone records for the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So um, this really started actually with our investigation into the Scripple poisoning, where you had these two suspects who, they went on to Russia today saying they were sports nutrition salesmen and they wanted to see Solsby Cathedral and mm -hmm. this fairy tale <laughs> they told. At that very same moment, my colleague Christo Grozov had used this kind of black market for data to buy their passport registration forms because we had their passport numbers from other leaked flight data. And there, like literally on their document, there was a stamp with a phone number that was the phone number of the Russian Ministry of Defense. And from there, we were able to start ordering all, all this related data. And we kind of had a theory that was based off an earlier uh, coup attempt in Montenegro where a GOU officer was arrested with two ID documents mm -hmm. and he had the same date of birth, place of birth and first name on both documents. So we used that template to investigate other sources to find the real identities of these two guys, these GRU officers. Mm -hmm. But that then led us on a kind of journey that took us to the Navani poisoning because we had identified the chemical weapon scientists they were all calling up before the uh, Scripple poisoning. Mm -hmm. And the FSB officers involved with that poisoning also called the same person. And it really just opens up a network of data because all their phone records, all the information about them is, you know, you can just go and buy it. And that's what we did and piece together who they were. And eventually we had the phone numbers and identities of everyone involved with that poisoning. And they just early morning in Germany with Navani, Christo and Navani with being filmed, phoned them up one by one. And it's like the first four or five people basically were like, we're not talking to you. But this one guy, he said he was at home with COVID and maybe he wasn't in the best state. And Navani just bullied him into saying, oh, I'm working for your superior officer. You need to tell me this stuff now. And he said, I can't do it. It's on an unsecure line. And he says, no, I need this information now. And the guy was like, okay. And they had just like a 50 minute conversation <laughs> where he, because we didn't know that the poison had been applied to the crotch of his underpants, which was uh, mm. quite a surprise. How, how did Navalny react when he, he got was that confession? so calm. Like, during the call, he was, like, ice cold. He did really well. Yeah. He, was, he really helped, kept control of everything. In fact, the call went on so, for so long, and we got so much stuff, that um, his colleague Maria and Christo were just, like, saying, just cull it, we've got everything we need now. Mm. And he put the phone down, and he said, OK, who do I call next after that call? So it was... <laughs> We were blown away with what we got there. But that, mm. what was great there, we could take all that information and use it to verify even more stuff that we had mm. discovered. So this is one of the uh, examples of what Bellingcat is doing. And just uh, pulling us back to the uh, audience questions here. Do you think disinformation will increase in global financial markets going forward? Disinformation? Well, it's really... <sighs> I mean, there's been efforts all over the place. One thing that's really been overlooked is kind of disinformation in the BRICS countries because there's been so much focus on the Arab Spring from the open source community, Ukraine and Russia. We don't really think in terms of India and China and what's happening there. So I think there's much greater risk in the global south and in China and those regions than there is currently in the West because people just aren't looking in the same way. So a big part of what we're trying to do is get those skills out to those regions. Mm. And how do, do we deal with this? 
the viewer asks. So one thing we're doing at Ballincat now is, it, it's my belief that people are drawn into conspiracy theories because they feel disempowered and they feel betrayed. Mm. Now, in a sense, you want to show people how to be empowered in a positive way. So we're doing one project at the moment where it's a pilot, but we're planning to train um, 100 teachers and team up with 100 journalists mm. and get them working with about 2,000 students across the UK to do investigations into local issues in their local mm. areas. Mm. Um, because I believe if you show them how to actually be empowered in a positive way, in a way that can actually affect change, mm. then they won't, won't be drawn into these online communities which really just tell them what they want to hear, draw them into conspiracy theories and disinformation, and just get them angry at other people on the internet when they feel empowered because they're upsetting someone when really they aren't really achieving anything. Mm. If someone would like to uh, move into this kind of work or do their own open source intel intelligence, what is the best tool that you would recommend? Oh, it's more about the toolbox than any individual tool. But what we try and show people is, you know, start with the most basic technique, which is geolocation. And I, I showed many mm -hmm. examples of how people do that online, um, because that really is a core skill. And find out where things happened. Yeah, and. We have loads of guides and case studies on Ballincat. There's communities online who do discuss this kind of thing. Um, so it's really just, in a sense, it's a much maligned phrase, but do your own research. You know, go to Ballincat and read all our resources, mm -hmm. see how we do stuff. It's just kind of involve yourself in the communities and the content that's coming out. And uh, now you've talked about the coming of age of, uh, of your work. If you look forward, what do you think is going to be the, the biggest trend? I think what we're going to see now is when there's future conflicts and other kinds of uh, events, we're going to see more and more of this kind of analysis being done mm -hmm. by mainstream media organisations. We'll be seeing that happening more with NGOs as well. Mm -hmm. We're already seeing various UN bodies using more open source evidence, the likes of the OPCW as well, working on chemical weapons. So it's really kind of become more and more mainstream, more and more widespread use. Mm -hmm. Um, there will be attempts to use disinformation based of open source evidence, but those attempts so far have failed because of the nature of open source evidence and how it can be checked. Mm. Quick question here from a viewer. Are you optimistic on behalf of global society? And if not, why not? I mean, there's plenty <laughs> not to be optimistic about, but you know, through my own work, I've seen how you know, individuals can be really involved in affecting change and actually bringing about accountability. There are things that we've investigated that had it not been for us looking into it, uh, and often it just almost accidentally discovering it, that there are people who've been jailed for terrible crimes because mm. of the stuff that we've done. So, I, and what I like about this kind of work is you can involve people from a whole range of different backgrounds. You don't need to go to university for three years to learn how to do it. It's something you can teach yourself to do and you can be involved with communities and really have your work amplified through those communities. Mm. Thank you so much for coming, Thank you. Elliot, and sharing these insights with us. Big applause for Elliot Higgins. Thank you.